2 Corinthians chapter 1. Um, last week what we covered uh, was the, the idea of our sufferings are made to temper us, to be able to be conditioned to help others who suffer. And that especially our sufferings in Christ, uh, even in our, our verses from Philippians, many of the brethren in the Lord waxing confident by my bonds are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Right? He, was, he was in bonds, he was in jail for preaching the gospel, and those who were around him and knew him were emboldened by that to preach the word even more boldly. And as we go through trials and we go through sufferings, and of course, we, we, I'm not going to re-preach all of last week's message, but uh, as we go through different things, um, we might not feel qualified to um, counsel somebody who's going through a, a hardship that we can't even comprehend. Okay? Uh, I think of uh, the Pizak family and the things that they're going through right now. I can't even comprehend losing a son. But God gives the grace in that hour. Uh, God gives that grace. But as we see here, um, let's look at look at verse 4 again. Who comfort us, comfort us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble. So the comfort that we have that comes from Christ, any comfort that we have received, the comforting of his word, the comforting of the Holy Ghost, calming us, because that is, that's his title, the comforter, is it not? Uh, I love the picture of that. And, uh, sadly, we rob him of a, of a ministry far too often. We get anxious, so we go to the physician for some pills to make us, make us less anxious. Uh, we, we get worried and, and uh, agitated, and so we'll smoke a cigarette just to take the edge off. Uh, we'll get home from work and we'll have just one beer. No, we don't. I don't, okay? But this is, this is sometimes what the mindset is, okay? You understand where I'm going with this. Uh, the person might take, you know, and just, just have that one beer just to take the edge off, just to settle in, unwind from the day, when all along that's the Holy Ghost job. That reason, more than any other, is the best reason not to drink alcohol. Amen. You're robbing God of his ministry in your life. Why would you want to do that? And so when we, when we consider all these things, um, as the, the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. Right? So it's Christ that is, is the one that is consoling the people through us. It isn't that we are doing anything or we have any grand words of wisdom. We can just share, hey, this is what I went through. And so when we consider that, you know, the, the, uh, the pain that's in your life, uh, many things are our own stupid doings. It's our own uh, arrogancy against the law of God. It's our own arrogancy uh, against iniquity, okay? And we, uh, in, in iniquity, we'll, we'll jump into sin and... Uh, the fallout from that is quite often the hardest time we things we have in our lives. And uh, I was talking with somebody just before the service, and when you come to the Lord and you repent of those things, if you're born again, that, that forgiveness is right there. 1 John 1, 9 is written to Christians, okay, believers who are already born again. And if we confess our sins, those are those physical things that we do, we're not confessing our sin, that was already taken care of at salvation, but the sins, the fruit of that sin nature, that carnal flesh, when we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see that, that God is just in forgiving us? It's a just thing for him to forgive us. That's justice, all right? Um, though we may be forgiven, there are still consequences. There may be scars that you'll bear the rest of your life because of what you decided to do. You knew it was wrong, you did it anyway. Those are those presumptuous sins that David begged God, don't let me fall into those things. Keep me from presumptuous sins. Um, and so then it goes on down through even further, and he talks about being dead. Um, it really, he says uh, that they despaired even of life. This is I believe when he was speaking of when he was in uh, Ephesus there and, uh, and in Philippi and, and these places where he was dealing with these, uh, really his life was on the line. 
And the reason that they left Antioch in the first place is because they considered themselves already dead. Missionaries at that time, when they said goodbye, they assumed that was the last time they were going to see that one on this side of eternity. Even up into the last oh, 150 years worth of missions work, when somebody said goodbye, that was the last time you were going to see them. Many of them took their own coffins with them onto the mission field because it was just it was cheaper that way than to get a coffin there. And so uh, the idea of, of uh, Amy Carmichael, just a chance to die. Oh, if I could only just have a chance to die for my Lord. Uh, but they despaired even of life, but he says, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, verse 9, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead. All right, so the confidence isn't in our flesh, it isn't in ourselves, but it's in God that even if we die, we know there's a resurrection coming. It's not the end for a believer. Uh, death is just that, that blinking out and then blinking in to eternity. Exhaling so that we can breathe in that celestial air. That's what it is. You know, when you, when you breathe, you've been sitting here breathing for the last 25 minutes or else you'd be passed off on, on passed out at least, on the pew. Um, have you noticed the time in between your exhales and your inhales? Have you noticed that? I bet you don't really even think about it. You exhale and then you just inhale again. That's all death is for the believer. That's, that's what expiring is, okay? It's exhaling, you know? And then we inspire, we <gasps> breathe in, okay? Um, pointing again to, you know, inspiration of God, and, and we've covered all that just recently, so we won't rehash it all again tonight. Uh, but now getting on down into uh, verse 12, I wanna, I wanna, I, we'll start at verse 11 because this will, this will kind of bring us into verse 12. Uh, before I get there, though, let's see. Brother Joel, could I have you pray for the time of the preaching? Lord, we come here tonight. Thank you for having an opportunity to open up your word again, Lord. Mm. Thank you for your preaching, Lord. Make things clear to us so that we may understand, Lord. I thank you for your word. It's precious. Never fails. Mm -hmm. It always will be. It always was. Lord. I thank you for it. Yes, God. Amen. Thank you. Verse 11 says, Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. And again, this is pointing to his servanthood as, a, as an apostle, as a preacher, as a servant of God. Uh, and he was thankful for the prayers that, that had really carried them along. Uh, and this points to uh, prayers for our missionaries being so vitally important. Um, without, and really for no reason more than that, that is why deputation is a beauty, all right? Uh, I know that there are some church groups that will, will fully support a missionary as soon as they say, God's calling me to the mission field, and they get them fully supported once they're, they've been gone through a formal training period, and then they send them out. Um, but what is lacking in that is the, the personal relationships that you make along the way. Uh, even in our short deputation time that we had, uh, getting ready to go to a clavic, we made friends that I know that they are still praying for us, uh, as we are now serving here. And those, those types of connections are absolutely beautiful. They're precious to us. Uh, and I know it's a precious thing to those, those faces that are represented back on that wall, uh, that we pray for them. That's why we, we hand out the prayer letters, why we send them out by email, why we post them, so that we can see how better to pray for our missionaries. Um, I did get a thank you letter, and I was going to bring it tonight. We'll, we'll read it next. Um, but from uh, in Fiji, the Dekus. Yes, thank you. We got, we got a thank you letter from them. And the beauty of that, I just want to point this out, the, the amazing thing. Um, he specifically, or she, I think she was the one that wrote it. It, it was definitely a lady's handwriting. That's usually the way we men work, you know. Um, she's my scribe. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the money that we sent them uh, to help with the baggage was the exact amount needed. How about that? For the extra baggage and everything that they needed to take, it was the exact amount. So 
Glory to God for that. Uh, we're very thankful we could do that. But at any rate, um, but that's why, why we need to pray. But we see that, that Paul, in, in his servanthood, you know, you're helping us together by prayer for us, that the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. So he's looking for being able to bless those who he's ministering to so that they can be given thanks on his behalf because of the prayers of the others who are praying for him and the gifts that were given to him. And, and this, is, this is New Testament churches working together with New Testament churches. Okay? Uh, this, is why, this is why we announce when there's a revival going on in one of the churches around. We can go and support that, which over at Chapel there, uh, Pastor Ireland, there is in March. Do you remember the dates of that right offhand? The week after whatever the 8th is. Yeah, we'll be, uh, we'll be announcing it um, uh, probably next week just so you can have it on, on your minds. But uh, they're having that. You know, we have the Youth Week up in Black Creek that we're, that we're planning to attend. Uh, I know that when we have uh, missionary, or yeah, missionary evangelist Tim McVeigh here, uh, I know that Black Creek and, and uh, the, uh, the church up there in Wellsville, Anchor Baptist, thank you, um, they'll be coming down, uh, and that's, that's how churches ought to be, you know, supporting one another and, and encouraging one another and exhorting one another. Uh, verse 12 now, coming on into this, he says, For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, in that simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. But here we're looking at this, this, this statement here that the testimony of our conscience. Right? He's talking about Paul and, and the group of men that he traveled with, that he preached with. He, by his conscience, there are other places where he refers to this as, as saying um, that he, he stands before God. You know, God is my witness in this thing. My conscience is clear in this, in this thing that he came to them in simplicity and in godly sincerity. He wasn't coming with a vendetta. He didn't come with an ulterior motive. He wasn't for his own vain glory. His whole purpose was to minister Jesus Christ unto the people, to share Christ with them, and to show them the error of their ways. Remember, this is written to that church at Corinth, that tangled up, mangled up mess of a church. And this is the second letter written, well, the, the letter right after at any rate. Um, there are, later on it says, this is the third time I've come to you and, and all of that. But as, as we consider uh, this letter being the follow-up of his first rebuking of them, it was, it was a sharp rebuke that he gave them. He went far beyond reproving. He was, he was outright just laying down the law. This is, this is the way it is. Uh, it's time to straighten up and start acting like adults here. Okay. Um, Many times we need that, don't we? If, if we're not acting like children, we're acting like teenagers. Okay? And honestly, there's no offense meant to you, but you are children trapped in adults' bodies. You don't have the world experience. You don't have the, uh, the maturity level to handle some of the things and situations that you yourself are getting into. I think of dating. Oh, good night. This is going to be a real popular topic. Dating is not in the Bible anywhere. You won't find anything remotely close to dating. What you find is two people coming together and they get married. Okay? Dating isn't practicing to see if this is the one you want to get married. There are proper ways to go about doing that. A couple hundred years ago, you know what they called it? Courting. Yeah. Uh, did you know there was no touching involved? Yeah. Do you know why there was no touching involved? Because the Bible says it's good for a man not to touch a woman. If you never hold hands with her, you'll never kiss her. If you never kiss her, you'll never touch her where you shouldn't. If you never touch her where you shouldn't, you'll never fornicate with her. If I can, if I can put it bluntly. These are the things that we as a society in America have gotten away from because we love our fornication. Don't we love that in America? Isn't It's on television everywhere. It's on every bit of social media. It's in every single outlet that you can possibly find. It's there. That spirit of whoredoms has overtaken our country. I believe it overtook this church for a time. I pray that it stays away. 
But as we consider the, the things that we allow in our lives, this is, the, every aspect of it is spiritual. And teenagers get into relationships and young people, get adolescents get into relationships. Good night, when I was driving the bus, there was a six-year-old kid who had a, a, a girlfriend. You know, it's like, what does it mean that you like them? Well, I don't know, I, I, I like them. I think they're hot. What do you mean by you think that they're hot? They don't know what these terms mean. They've just heard them. Okay, let's let kids be kids. Mm, usually. Let's let children be children. Let's let youths be youths. And folks, let's be adults. Okay. Uh, sadly, we have to address things very clearly and bluntly from the pulpit like this. And I will always use the Bible terms for it. I will never be vulgar, but I'm not gonna hold anything back. If it, if it genders questions from your children, I would love to sit down and talk with them, with you about these things, honestly, but I guarantee you they know more than you know. I guarantee you they know more than they let you know. Okay? This is just the nature of life in 2022 in America. Okay? It's hard things that we have to deal with, uh, but that's, that's the way it is. And in simplicity and godly sincerity, I stand before you with a clean conscience. And this is what Paul was doing. He was addressing things as needed. Uh, he says, not with fleshly wisdom. You know, there is a difference between godly wisdom and carnal wisdom. Godly wisdom and fleshly wisdom. Wisdom that comes from God and wisdom that comes from your experiences in the flesh. You know, what's funny is, is when we'll have a life experience, we have something that we have literally had happen in our lives. And so all of a sudden we've been through this hard time or we've been through this situation and we are now wise to that because we've come through it and we've analyzed the whole thing and we know what happened, why it happened, and, and this is it. And so now we have this wisdom that we've gained from going through this situation and we look at the, the world and this, this person comes to us and they say, oh, what, what, what do I do? I've gone through this. And you say, ah, I've been through this same situation. Let me share my wisdom that I learned. And you share that wisdom. 87% of the time, now understand 95% of all statistics are made up on the spot. But 87% of the time, that wisdom that you gleaned from that situation was fleshly wisdom and the outcome is contrary to the Word of God. So, a situation you've been through, something you know this is why it happened, this is what happened, it happened to me. But it disagrees with the Word of God. Am I wrong or is the Bible wrong? I'm wrong. But I saw it with my own eyes. This is what happened. Yep, I perceived it wrong. I had a carnal mind about that. I wasn't looking at it in a spiritual light. If anything, any wisdom comes from anywhere but here, whether it's a really good Christian author, whether it's a really good book on psychology, whether it's a really, really good commentary that your great-great-granddaddy read, if it's different than this, it's wrong. This has to be your final authority. It has to start with what you consider this book to be. Is it guidelines? Or is it the Word of God? But in simplicity and sincerity, not fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. Grace is receiving something you don't deserve, a blessing. I don't deserve the grace of having a beautiful wife. I don't deserve that grace. All right? I deserve to be alone, unemployed in Greenland, to quote a movie that I love. Some of you might know the same movie, all right? At any rate, I don't deserve this at all. Many of you know me enough to say, yeah, he's right, he don't deserve this. That's, that's got to be a grace from God. Um, but when you consider grace, he was serving in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God. Any godly wisdom that he gives you is a grace from him. You don't deserve it. There's nothing in you that deserves anything but the deepest, hottest pit of hell, truthfully. And if you keep that in your mind, it gets the spotlight off of me. 
I. What do I deserve? I deserve better than this. Hmm. Yeah, you don't. That's what you hear in America, though, isn't it? That's the American dream. You deserve this. You deserve better. You know, that, those commercials for the, the lawsuits. I want my money and I want it now. You know, I deserve my, my, my comeuppance. Yeah. When you, when you consider and, and put yourself up against the light of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, you'll see you don't deserve anything. Got to keep that perspective. If you don't, you'll get covetous. You'll wallow in self-pity. I'm telling you what, self-pity is addictive, isn't it? Isn't, isn't self-pity addictive? Don't you just love to feel sorry for yourself? And to pour your heart out to people? And to, to lay it all on the line because that's, that's just going to, oh, it just makes me feel good. It bolsters me up. Again, who's your comforter? People or the Holy Ghost? But he says, by, gra- by the grace of God, we, have, our con- we had, have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. All right? To you word shows the, the direction that their, their conversation was directed. Okay? So it's, it's a, a way to di- say more clearly. All right? Our conversation was before the world. It was open and before everybody's eyes but it was directed to you, okay? That, that's showing the accuracy. It isn't just that I had my conversation before the church here and before the world. No, I was directly living for the purpose that you could see the glory of Christ in me. That was my drive. That was my goal. That's what Paul is saying. The world saw it too, but it was for you. Okay? He's showing the personal relationship that he has with the Corinthian church, showing his love for them, okay? There's still going to be some, some reproving in this letter, but it's not the rebuking that he had to do in the first letter. He's, gonna, he's going to lay out some more hard truths for them, but he's also going to lay out some beautiful, deep doctrine, some things about God that, that Jesus Christ himself revealed to him, and also that Jesus gave him a thorn in the flesh so that he wouldn't become too proud because of the uh, abundance of the revelations. We're going to see that. But his love was for them, and, and his, uh, his ministry was directly to them. Verse 13 continues. It says, For we write none other things unto you than what ye read, read or acknowledge. And I trust ye shall acknowledge even to the end. As also ye have acknowledged us in part, that we are your rejoicing, even as ye also are ours in the day of the Lord Jesus. All right, so basically what what he's saying here is there is coming a day when we will stand before Christ, the day of the Lord, okay? And he will be rejoicing in that day because of the church at Corinth, okay? They will be rejoicing in that day because of him and the ministry that he had to them. All right, this is, this is what he's laying out for. Uh, when we live in light of the judgment seat, you know, there's, there's a saying, all roads lead to Rome, right? Because back in the time of the Roman days, every single road there was started at Rome and went out from there. And everywhere that they conquered, they built roads, and every single one of those roads directed to Rome. But one thing you can consider for every single soul, from Adam to the very last one that will draw a breath before the judgment seat of Christ, all roads lead to the judgment. It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. All roads lead to the judgment seat. And when you live in light of that, the small things of this earth, they do grow strangely dim. The little problems that we have, the splinters that we have in our hand, they don't seem quite as bad. Right? I, I hate getting splinters. Working with wood, I get them a lot. Sometimes I don't even notice them until they start creeping out from underneath my fingernails. Anybody who's worked with wood understands that. Lou, you probably have them all the time, don't you? Yep. But what about the bigger things? Well, it gives you a different perspective. The big things in your life are still big things. If they're big to you, they're big to me, and they're big to God. 
but they're not going to be quite so big to God if it's just you feeding on your addiction to drama, you're feeding on your addiction to self-pity, you're feeding on your addiction to being in the center of everything, being in the know. Uh, that's really covetousness. Uh, you can covet things, but you can also covet situations. You ever consider that? Uh, the problems in your life that you see in somebody else's life and, and they've got it so much worse. It's, it's a twisted way to think, but a lot of people think that way. Well, I wish I had that problem because then I would be the center of attention. Um, and that's very subtle. And, and that's not the type of thing you can just walk up to somebody and say, hey, snap out of it. You know, um, I don't know, maybe some people need that. Some people need that harsh rebuke. You know, they need to be shaken up and, and woken up. But uh, many times that's not, it's not done in love. And uh, so that it, the outcome then is not the glory of God. The wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Okay. If you ever have to rebuke somebody, and you very well may in your life have to rebuke somebody, um, make sure you do it biblically. Rebuke not an elder, the Bible says. You can reprove an elder, but don't rebuke them. Okay, it's all in the heart. Um, but when you do rebuke somebody, make sure it's still in love. You want them to wake up, to see what's going on, to see what's going wrong, and to show them the right way. All right, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. That long suffering is that love and that that suffering long for that one person. Okay, that's what long suffering is. It's a, it's an easy way to remember the definition of that word. Um, but doctrine, make sure you've got scripture for whatever it is that you're bringing to that person. If you don't, you probably don't have any business dealing with that in a rebuking sort of way. Okay, um, it takes a, a level of spiritual maturity. All right, so verse 15 now. And in this confidence, I was minded to come unto you before that you might have a second benefit. Now, what is this second benefit? This second benefit, well, what was the first benefit of them coming, of him coming to Corinth? Well, the, the gospel. Okay, that was the first benefit. But one thing that the Apostle Paul had that nobody has today was the ability to give spiritual gifts. Hey, the apostles were granted that power. Why? They were given special authority for that transition period. From the time of the beginning of Matthew until the time of the end of Acts, this is a transition time. Where I differ from normal dispensationalists, and honestly, you asked me what a definition of dispensationalist is, I couldn't tell you. I really don't care. That word's not in the Bible. But I understand what people are coming from, from dispensationalists. Uh, the idea is that at the beginning uh, was the, the era, of, uh, era of innocence and when they were in the, the Garden of Eden, and then uh, that changed, and, and then it was the, the time leading up to Moses, and then from that time there was the, the law that was given, and then uh, there, there was the, the time coming up into to Jesus' time, and then uh, right up to the cross and the resurrection, and that brought in the new uh, church age here, and then at the, after, at the rapture, then that's going to bring in the tribulation period. After the tribulation is the thousand-year reign, and then after the thousand-year reign is the battle of Armageddon, and then the new heaven and new earth, and that's dispensationalism in a nutshell. There are those divisions throughout the Bible, and a dispensation is spoken of in the Bible, but what that is is a dispensing of authority, okay? He has this, this, uh, this dispensation uh, committed unto him, it says. Paul says this. Um, but where I differ from most dispensations, I don't think that there was somebody with a trumpet announcing, burr, 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 okay, this is a new dispensation, and then everything changes just like that. All right? You don't, you don't see that in the Bible. There are things that happened in the early church that don't happen today. Okay, that's just the fact of it. There were times when in, in that early church, and, and you'll see, and when you really start getting a broader view, when you get in like this, it, it's awfully hard to stay doctrinally accurate. Okay, when you're looking like this, because you see the, the day of Pentecost right here. Okay, so they spoke in tongues. So that means I can speak in tongues. Well, why did they speak in tongues? Well, at the day of Pentecost, the miracle wasn't in the speaking, it was in the hearing. Wasn't it? You look at Acts chapter 2, 
And everybody heard their own tongue wherein they were born. They heard their native tongue, though the apostles were just preaching. Okay? The miracle was in the hearing. All right? So then you, you get out a little bit further and you see Paul writing about this thing and the proper use of it in a service, and it was for unbelieving Jews. That's the purpose of tongues. Okay, well, all right, well, that's fine. I can get that. And oh, well, the tongues are going to cease to show the power of God. Okay, well, I don't want to do something that's not going to show the power of God. So I won't seek to use those, those languages. It, none of them had to learn that. That was the, the supernatural aspect of it. They didn't have to practice repeating syllables over and over and over again to fall into a trance of, of praying in the Spirit. Okay. I say this, this is what's mostly spoken of, how tongues are used today. Uh, praying in the Spirit, um, I, I preached against that very sharply. Somebody had sent me a video of somebody that was showing the real true power in spiritual warfare was this praying in tongues. And uh, even explained, told the guy how to do it and this is how you practice it and all of that. You don't see anybody having to be taught how to do those things, okay? Even if it was that in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, I mean. So, at any rate, all I have to say, zooming out, the book of Acts is a transition period. You even see it from the beginning to the end. Look at the transmission of the Holy Ghost, okay? Jesus, in the, I think it was in John, he breathed on the disciples and he said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Okay? Guess what? They received the Holy Ghost. Good way to look at that is your internet connection. It was a direct plug into the wall. So that was one computer connected to the internet. Okay? We can use this example today because we have technology. Um, but as we get into the day of Pentecost, now all of a sudden it is a Wi-Fi signal of the Holy Ghost. It's available to everyone, not just the apostles and the disciples that were there in that room, but everyone has access to it. All right, so why did Peter and Paul have to lay hands on some people to transmit the Holy Ghost? Why was that? There's really a simple answer for that. Those were people that were alive and that were born again before the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, when Paul went into those, those ones, um, I think it was at Ephesus, there was, there was 12 of them meeting, I think it was, 12 disciples, and they said, he says, do you, do you know, have you received the Holy Ghost? And he said, we didn't even know if there was such a thing as a Holy Ghost. Uh, they, were, they were disciples of John. They had been born again from the preaching of John in Ephesus. And as they were, they were there, uh, he lays hands on them, and they receive the Holy Ghost. What you don't see is somebody who's born again after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you don't see Paul or Peter or anybody laying hands on them for them to receive the Holy Ghost. When you look at even Peter, when he deals with this very thing, he does lay hands on people and people do receive the Holy Ghost. But what about when he went to the Gentiles and he was preaching to them? And as he was preaching, they began showing the signs. It even caught him off guard. He said, well... Well, who can hinder water? These, if they're showing the signs of the Holy Ghost, God's given them the Holy Ghost just like he did us. And from that point forward, you don't see Peter laying hands on anybody to give them the Holy Ghost. It's this transition period going on right now. Okay? And so at this time, there were things that Paul was able to transmit. Think about what he says to Timothy. Uh, Stir up the gift of God which is in thee from the laying on of my hands. Timothy received spiritual gifts directly from the Apostle Paul. God gave him that authority to do that. Nobody has that authority today. That, that ended when the last Apostle died. Okay? You don't, if, if somebody comes to you and says that they're an Apostle, if they mean an Apostle by one cent, okay, that's great. But quite often they'll claim apostolic authority in that. They're a charlatan and a liar. Very well could be that they are a devil. Think about, um, on, on that note, this is just something extra that, that I've stumbled upon. Think about uh, Judas Iscariot. He says, did not I call you all and one of you is a devil? Not has a devil, is a devil. Okay. Um, there's, a, there's a theory and a, a very good theory. And 
I'm not putting my stamp of approval on this, but search it out for yourself and just see what the Lord shows you. Um, that the Antichrist is going to be a resurrected Judas Iscariot. That the Antichrist is going to be a resurrected Judas Iscariot. The Antichrist is going to be killed, and he will be resurrected again. All right? Everything that Jesus did, Satan mimics. Jesus rides in on a white horse. Who does the Antichrist ride in on? A pale horse. Oh, it's so close. Not quite. And when you really start digging into the Bible for what it literally says, what it actually says, there are these little things that you can say, well, interesting, that connects with that over there, and that explains this verse over here that I was always confused about. Huh. And that's how God lays precept upon precept, line upon line, and he builds your faith. And he, he builds doctrine that way from your Bible. But these are the things. This is that second benefit. He wanted to, to come to them again to give them that second benefit. Hey, hey there, there was more things he wanted to distribute to them. There was more, uh, more spiritual gifts. There was more uh, knowledge that he wanted to impart, more revelations that he wanted to personally give to them. And these are the things that only the Apostle Paul really could do. All right? Now, the other apostles, they were just as able uh, but Paul was, was sent to the Gentiles. That was his, that was his calling. Um, 1 Peter. Thursday night, March 3rd. We're starting into 1 Peter. God just gave that to me right now. So that's, that's what we're studying. Um, if you're interested in it, Thursday night, 6 Thursday, uh, 630, uh, starting March 3rd. We're going to be down in the classroom. 6.30 to 7.30, we're just going to start going verse by verse, line upon line, word by word, and there'll be time for discussion, there'll be time for examination, um, all of this. So, starting into 1 Peter. There's a reason I know why he just planted that in me, so we'll get to that if you come on March 3rd. If you don't come on March 3rd, you'll never know why. Okay. All right, so the second benefit, and it says, verse 16, And to pass by you into Macedonia, and to come again out of Macedonia unto you, and, uh, and of you to be brought on my way toward Judea. And so he was going to come in, visit with them, uh, be, of course, remembering Macedonia is north of Achaia, which is where Corinth is. Corinth is in the south. Macedonia is up here. You remember Philippi, and uh, I believe Ephesus is up there, and, and all of those other other foreign towns. I can't remember my geography perfectly. That's where Mr. Bat comes into play with his maps. We need you with maps instantly. We can just pull them up. Uh, oh, that's good. That's good. I like that. Yeah. If you want to know exactly what's in Macedonia, look in your Bible. Um, if your Bible has maps in the back, at any rate. Uh, but he was going to come down and visit them through Macedonia touching the other churches on his way to Judea. Okay, this is, these are his travel plans here. It says, verse 17, When I therefore was thus minded, did I use lightness? Or the things that I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh, that with me there should be yea, yea, and nay, nay? All right, this is, this is something that uh, can be confusing. Why not just say yes and no? All right, this, these are answers to questions. All right, it's clarifying something. It's deeper than yes and no. All right, when uh, an answer needs a direct, absolute yes or an absolute no, people would use yay or nay. Okay, it, and that's really what this boils down to. And when it's put side by side like that, it's showing that he didn't want there to be any confusion. It was either going to be yes or it was going to be yo. No, it was going to be either yay or it was going to be nay. There was, there's no variableness in him. Just like children need to have set boundaries, consistent set boundaries. When I was driving school bus, I found for the first couple of days, while the children were learning those boundaries, they were like a caged animal. All of a sudden, 
they feel claustrophobic and, oh, there's a rule and I'm just, I'm, oh, and they're bouncing all over the place trying to get out of that or they'll, they'll wiggle their way right to the edge of that thing. And, but as soon as they know where the boundaries are, they find comfort in that. Children need rules. Children need parents. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate that. Children need parents. Woe unto a nation whose child is a king. Okay? Right now, our nation is being ruled by children. And our children are being ruled. I don't have my cell phone in my pocket, but it's right back there. Being ruled by that. Um, I remember Ernie Blackburn talking. Um, I think he was preaching one time, and he was talking about uh, the television. And he was lamenting over the fact that he used the television as a babysitter. That's always stuck with me. Parents, be very cautious about using technology as a babysitter. They need a parent. Moms, they need a mom. Dads, they need a father. You're not their friend. You can be friendly with them. There will come a time. Those of you who have adult children, it shifts, doesn't it? There's a paradigm shift. When they get, I'm, I'm not looking at you, my love, I'm looking at the bats, okay? <laughs> I found it in my own family. With my dad, there's a shift. He's, he's, he's one of my best friends now, okay? Um, and you find that shift in your children. That will come, but spare not for their crying. Oh, but I want that. That's fine. You can go ahead and want it. You won't remember it on your wedding day. All right. That's what my dad always used to say. You know, you'll never remember this on your wedding day. And he's right. I don't, I don't remember anything from my wedding day. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, there needs to be that, but there needs to be that, that hard, those hard lines, those rules. Okay. Teenagers crave structure. Why do you think they're always trying to set their own guidelines? They want that structure. And when you aren't there to give them that set boundaries and that structure in their life and that consistency in their life, I understand work schedules and such. Honestly, if, if you've got a job that, that continually keeps you away from your family, I want you to look real hard as to whether or not it was God that gave you that job. Satan can give you a job just as quickly as God can, okay? Um, I think of some of our young men uh, looking for jobs right now. And if I give you counsel at all, make sure it's God that has that job for you, not Satan. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen a lot of families torn apart because of work. It becomes an idol, becomes a, a God, you know? Um, and so that's, 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 a, that's, a, that's a hard thing to... To teach because, uh, especially in this area, we have factory workers, you know, we have, we have swing shift and shift work and, and all these things. And uh, really, there isn't much else. Um, <laughs> but you'd be surprised what you can live on. Do you really need $30 an hour to live? According to your lifestyle right now, probably. But you'd be surprised what you can live on. It's pretty neat when you don't have any income coming in, but yet you pray to God for your daily bread, and he brings it. When Elijah was being fed by the, the, the ravens, good night. I've seen ravens eat literally everything in a clavic. They, they will literally eat anything. Uh, one was playing with a golf ball the one day. It's the funniest thing. He was picking it up and tossing it up in the air, and he'd lay down on the side, and he'd kick the golf ball, but um, he was trying to eat that golf ball. I don't know if he thought maybe it was an egg. I don't know. But I've seen him at the dump just eating everything. And yet God used ravens to feed Elijah. Does God change? No. Uh, what changes, though, is our perception of just how big our God is. And what's really important. Uh, we'll, we'll pause there. We'll pick back up uh, at verse 15 and, and continue on through here to the end of the chapter next week. Uh, no, not actually next week. Next week we'll have uh, Nathan Lee 
Uh, he'll be preaching in the evening service. I'm looking forward to, th to that. Um, and so it'll be the week after that. But uh, if you want, go ahead and read on, uh, head on through that. Study out that yay, yay, and nay, nay. Uh, look everywhere in your body, or yeah, your body, your Bible, where the word yay and nay are used. See how they're used. And what you'll see is that there are things that are more specifically uh, pointed out. There, there's more accuracy in that statement than just a simple yes or no. Okay, there's more gravity. There's more weight to it. Um, in, in legal speak, uh, in dealing with regulations and such, uh, when I worked for Shell, we had to be very careful as to listing out when the, the PUC would ask us what we were going to do as far as patrolling our pipelines and all these different things. We had to be very careful of the wording that we used. If we said the word shall, that was a legally binding term and it would happen. All right. Even if the river flooded and something happened bigger than a hen coop, I mean, I mean, that's what my grandmothers used to say, you know, Lord willing, if the creek don't rise and nothing happens bigger than a hen coop. I don't know what that meant, but she always said it, and so I still say it. Uh, but at any rate, it didn't matter. That would happen. We would make that happen. But if we said will, we will do this, there was wiggle room there, legally. Okay? That's the difference between yay and yes. Okay? Dig into that this week. It's, it, it'll be a fun study for you. Um, if nothing more, it'll get you in your Bibles, and that's always fun. Amen. Uh, let's go ahead and we'll, we'll close this time in prayer. Father, we thank you for this night. God, I thank you for uh, opening your word to us. And Lord, I pray that the people here were blessed, uh, not for blessing's sake again, God, because we, we don't want to be a blessing hungry people. But God, we just, we want to see you. We want to know you more. We want to uh, understand who you are and, and who we are in light of that. And so Father, I pray that you continue to use these studies that we're, that we're doing and uh, Lord, that you would uh, guide us and, and direct us uh, deliberately, Lord, uh, as, we, as we seek you. We thank you for it, Lord, and help us to apply the things that we've learned today. Uh, God, the things that you've smitten our hearts with, Lord, I pray that we would indeed lay those at your feet. And God, be prepared for whatever you lay upon us. Father, we thank you for it. And God, I just pray that you were blessed by what you heard tonight. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.